Gav Cooney's there. Gav, good morning to you. Hello, hello, Qatar. Morning, uh, Jerry. Not to feel you, um, make you feel even less special than evidently you already um, obviously are. I too managed to get an invite to that French ambassador's party, but obviously couldn't go. You turned it I'm down. Stuck Mistake. Stuck here in Qatar. Mistake. I was very, very. There's, I've, I've got quite a bit of FOMO this week. I have to say between Christmas parties, etc. Uh, yeah, and that too. Uh, well, go the next time. That's all I'll say. Mm. It does make the next day work a little bit harder, especially when your mm. partner in crime is as crook, speak, Crooky yeah. McCroak here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so who's your player of the tournament? This is the, the first conversation that we've been having. Uh, what does Antoine Griezmann need to do to uh, prevent Leo Messi from picking up the bauble? Uh, that France would win the World Cup and even still, then Messi might still win it as he did rather grudgingly in 2014 after Argentina lost. And Messi, uh, well, actually, Messi didn't deserve to win the player of the tournament in 2014, but I think he deserves it now. I think Messi's the player of the tournament, uh, and Griezmann and, um, and Mbappe are, are also in the running. Griezmann has been outstanding for France uh, throughout the tournament in this retooled role of a deep lying, creative midfielder who does a lot of the defensive work of that uh, French forward line. Um, and he was excellent again last night. You know, he, he managed to find those little pockets of space around uh, Morocco's pretty compact shape. So, Griezmann is there. Mbappe remains the difference maker. He doesn't, he is just watching him in, from the stands. He is exquisitely disinterested in defending, uh, which did cause France a problem in the second half. But he ultimately is the difference maker. He usually is for France um, and Messi. And he, he won't get, they won't get it now because Morocco are out. But Azadine Unahi, the number eight uh, in midfield for Morocco, he's a, he is absolutely brilliant. I mean, I know he's linked to Barcelona. I think there's probably better moves out there than um, him going to Barcelona, given Gavi and Pedri are already there. But uh, he he is outstanding. Uh, is there is there? Uh, sometimes we like to overact in overreact in the moment to trends, but sometimes World Cups do kick something into uh, the best coaches' minds. The idea of taking a forward and putting them into central midfield it's not new, right? But uh, if you've got someone like Griezmann uh, or Phil Foden say perhaps we might start seeing some good ball players playing as that deep lying holding midfielder and that's the next trend as opposed to the oh he's so good he can play centre back or midfield Plausibly I think Griezmann is a special case just because his work rate is so good he's such a unique player I mean he's you know, I can't exactly remember the Diego Simeone line after he left, uh, after he le- initially left Atletico for Barcelona, like asked, how do you replace Antoine Griezmann? Well, how do you replace a guy who's a striker and, and a midfielder all rolled into one? You should, like, I mean, Griezmann's work ethic is absolutely excellent. Like, you can obviously see it again from the ground. He's, he'll often pop up back in his own penalty area, hacking clear uh, crosses. He's the one who stops mm. counterattacks sometimes rather cynically. I know England were very exercised that he didn't get a second yellow card in their quarterfinal. So I don't know if you'll see that become a trend. I mean, plausibly, I think the trends we, we've seen at this World Cup is... Uh, the big number nine is back in fashion. And we've probably seen it, it uh, at club level as well, given that Erling Haaland has signed for Manchester City and, and perhaps to a lesser extent with Darren Nunez signing for Liverpool. But uh, central strikers have been so important in this tournament. Olivier Giroud, Giroud did not have his greatest performance last night. But he's been very important for France. And, you know, you do wonder, like, when you talk about trends of this tournament, is this the kind of the late age decaying tiki-taka, like... You know, we've seen the limits of it in many ways. Like Spain went out as a parody of themselves. Morocco showed how to defend against it. You just, you're just, you just fold into a really compact shape of about 15 meters between, uh, between the defense and the forward line of your team. You just don't give uh, teams any space or any angles with which to make those passes. And then Spain struggled. Germany struggled as well. Like Hansi Flick went out lamenting that we needed a reboot. Um, Arsene Wenger had an interesting stat from the group stages that eight, there was an 86% increase on goals scored from open play crosses at this World Cup. He said that meant that the team with the best wingers would win the World Cup. That might also mean that the team with the best central striker might win it either. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I if it automatically follows the team with the best wingers. It's like, uh, you know, maybe if you had Trent in your team, you might have been able to uh, lump a few good quality balls into the box. I, and look, it's obviously re- revisionism at this point. Um, you know, Trent in his absence has become a cause celeb for certainly the Liverpool supporting uh, England analysts. Um, let's go back to Messi though, right? Because he's your mm. your pick for player of the tournament. Um, sometimes when you're at games, 
you actually miss the genius because it's like so close and so fast. What was your view like of the uh, the Messi assist? Mm, well, I mean, the, the great thing about Messi is that he's not fast anymore, and yet he's still he's still pulling off the, these tricks. Like he faces up Yasko Gvardiol down Argentina's right wing. Like now, Gvardiol has been the best defender in this tournament. He's 15 years younger than Messi. He's 15 centimeters taller. So I mean, it's all <laughs> it's all weighted towards Guardiola winning this uh, battle. Messi goes by him, but then doesn't have the the burst of speed that he once had uh, to go straight into the box. So Guardiola then catches up, pushes Messi back out toward uh, facing toward the uh, the flank. So Messi then just has to kind of beat him all over again. He checks back a feint to his right, and then that Guardiola buys hook, line, and sinker. Then away Messi goes. He just wriggles away down along the end line uh, and slips the pass through. It took me, I was only on replay that I realized that the pass went through Guardiola's legs uh, and was then obviously tucked in by, by Julian Alvarez to, to frame the art. Just amazing moment. You know, I have to say, it's such a privilege to be, uh, you know, have an effective ringside seat to, uh, to performances like this for Messi like why thinking about this like why do we want Messi to be why do we want him to win this World Cup because in many ways he's not that likeable a guy you know he's uh, he's on the Qatari payroll he's taken a, um, a money spinning a money spinning ambassadorship with uh, with Saudi Arabia you know he's not he's not the sweet son-in-law anymore he's got a beard he's tattooed he's tattooed he's flaring his nostrils like any of the great Argentine players in the past but I think we just want to be we just want to see important things happen. We want to see great events. We want to say that we were at the World Cup that was the counterpart of Maradona in 86. We want to see things endowed by the genius of the greatest players. And that's kind of what's happening at the moment with Messi. Like he has been brilliant. This has been his best World Cup performance. Forget his age. Like this has been the best we've seen at a World Cup of Lionel Messi with a better supporting cast around him, though limited in many ways as they are. And now this... Uh, the the impossibly beautiful dream uh, of uh, of Lionel Messi in Argentina is one more one more step to go. Although uh, it is obviously the most difficult one. Did the atmosphere noticeably change when Messi got the ball, Gav? Uh, did it? Yeah, I, maybe people maybe there was a slightly pregnant pause of breath, um, but. I don't know, like the Argentine fans just keep on singing, you know, I mean, the the atmosphere that they create is fantastic. Like they, they, they don't really have chance. They have these kind of epic poems, which they sing on endless loop. It's so it's, it's, it's got an amazing rhythm to it. And unfortunately you only hear it during the game because the inane pregame hype dazes it all in, uh, in, in crap music over the two loud PA system. Uh, but I think there probably was a pregnant pause. I'm, tr- I'm just trying to remember. There was definitely a, you're not allowed to cheer in the press box, and I do obviously respect that. But there is there there are a couple of sharp intakes of breath uh, in almost disbelief. It's just such a great thing to watch. And then uh, the reaction of the Argentine crowd is amazing. Like uh, after Messi does anything, uh, they literally they bow in supplication at his feet, chanting Messi, Messi, Messi. Like it is a it is a religious reverie. It's funny. Like if if um, Ibrahim Kanade plays like he did last night, at least. France could have a chance against that Argentinian attack. Like, Can I, yeah, Canati was really good, wasn't he? Like, Obama can has got had a flu. This is, I don't know how much of an issue this is going to be for France, but there's a, there is a kind of a flu like virus uh, sweeping through their camp as it has swept through many camps in Qatar, including the press corps. Like, the, a lot of journalists have fallen quite ill. A couple, of, I think, have been have been sent to hospital. A couple have gone home. There are an awful lot of coughs and splutters uh, among us all, and uh, it's affecting players' camps as well. So, Rabio missed with a virus as well last night. Pamacano uh, was sick as well. Both were isolated from the squad. Pamacano is um, he's I think he got ill before Rabio, so he's probably more likely to be ready for the final. But I guess the terror is that uh, for France is that other players might be affected by the, by this virus. Um. That would be really annoying if all of a sudden there was a, a massive imbalance in the two teams as a result of that, given that we got this far. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, you make the point about Messi, but the same thing can really be said about Mbappe. If if he pulls off, he's on the same schedule as Pele, basically, a couple of years behind or a year behind um, when Pele won in, in 58 and 62. And, like... Uh, yeah, he's, he's right there in any of those conversations. If he wins two World Cups by the age of, is he 22, 23? Is he turning 23 mm-hmm. soon? Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah. No, he would be the most dominant player across multiple World Cups since Pele. And he's absolutely like, oh, the, I mean, what is more can you really say about him? Like, he is, 
he's brilliant. He is exquisitely disinterested in, in defending. Um, one of the most thrilling things I've ever seen on a football pitch is his speed from a standing start. When you watch him for 90 minutes, you realise how committed he is to the standing start. Like, he really doesn't move a whole lot until the ball comes near him. And then he just explodes, you know? Like, he he doesn't really run on to through balls. He just kind of teleports to them. I've never I've never seen such pace in my life. But then it's not just pace, is it? Like, I mean, he's got the he's got the feints, he's got the swerves uh, of the body to uh, to deceive defenders, which uh, obviously Messi, had, Messi still has, although Mbappe is, is working at, at, at the speed that... Well, he probably even a greater speed than Messi was capable of in the prime of his career. So, yeah, they, they are the two. I don't know. There was a great picture after the 2018 World Cup when France beat um, beat Argentina. It was of Mbappe and Messi, and it felt like a passing of a passing of the guard. Messi's still around. It's not over just yet. Mbappe will become the dominant player of his generation, but uh, the guy from the previous generation is uh, is still hanging about. It's a bit like 2018 as well, Gavin. That like France in some ways have been unconvincing like the same as they were four years ago but went on to win they're so like they're a truly irritating way of winning games France don't they I mean they're uh, they've got this collection like in terms of a collection of individual players they're the best international team in the world at the moment I'm struggling to think of counterparts for them in my lifetime at least um, and there's vast swathes of games where they're nowhere near as good as they should be collectively I mean they just kind of almost do nothing, you know I mean? And then they obviously give opponents hope uh, and then they shatter that hope through their individual quality. And we saw it again last night. I mean, Morocco took over after halftime. That, that was partly down to the bonus of their approach. Morocco were the better team for chunks of that game. France, again, weren't really doing anything. They don't control possession. I've never seen a team so good, so always being able to play in the counter-attack. I cannot understand it, but it always manages to happen. And then Mbappe just beat dance, dances by three players in the penalty area and his shot um, to false his substitute, whose name currently escapes me, I'm sorry, uh, who rolls it in with his first touch. But, you know, you say it's, I mean, it's the same conversation, Shane, as we had four years ago. Like, our France you know, I, there was a line in the Guardian, like, are France actually any good? They clearly are good. They're not as, as good as they should be. Um, and it should, they definitely aren't as good if, um, as if, if this side was a club side playing together all the time, they'd be absolutely phenomenal. Um, but they, they, they sometimes look like they lack cohesion. They often lack flow and control of games. But they've got, you know, they've got the ultimate counterpunch and they uh, managed to, they managed to take that out of their arsenal in every game they play. Um, Really, for Morocco to have won last night, oh, look, maybe maybe there's a, a way for them to come back, but we hadn't seen them concede, really, and, and so it turns out it's very difficult when you're a team built not to concede and you do concede so early on. But was there just a little bit where the head coach bottles it a bit at the start mm. and then realises, ah, I bottled that, and fixes it, and then it's like, oh, this could have been much better? I think so. I have to say, I think I agree. Um, because we they, we going into the game, we thought they'd lost three of their first choice back four in Saiz, Aguerd and Masrawi. And then all of a sudden, all three were named to start in this back five. Uh, but by halftime, they'd lost them twice. Um, Aguerd pulled out of the warm up. Currently, he was he had he had the flu as well. Like he had this virus. Um, and then Saiz was clearly unfit. <laughs> I mean, there, there is there is no more basic fitness test than do not be outpaced by Olivier Giroud. And yet he was. He hobbled over to that long ball and Giroud hit the post and, and Morocco got away with it. And then Maserawi didn't appear after half time. So that was, I think that was probably a mistake. You know, I, I don't know if the coach admitted afterwards that, you know, this is probably a step too far because too many of our players weren't fit. But then they swapped from a back five to a back four after Sykes went, went off and they, they were much better, you know. They uh, Now, look, partly that's because France were a goal up and they, they didn't attack with the same vigour because they could, you know, France liked to soak up pressure and hit you on the counter-attack. But they looked better with an extra man in midfield. All of a sudden, you know, our, our old pal Unai was, um, and the the replacement is at Ama, um, Alama, uh, managed to find loads of space in behind Fofana and, and Chiaomeni in the French midfield and started like linking quite well with Ziyech and Buffal and, uh, and creating a couple of chances and, and causing all kinds of, of problems for France. So I do think, you know, I mean, it's there. there is always that temptation, isn't, isn't there, to, to hope that, you know, your top, player, your top players are fit. Um, Jurgen Klopp did it in the Champions League final when Thiago seemed to get injured in the warm-up and then started after the game was delayed by however long that kickoff was delayed. And it probably turned out to be a mistake. And it was a mistake here again as well. 
Like what what type of final do you think we can expect, Gav, in terms of styles of these two teams? Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Uh, I haven't really thought too much about it. I mean, France. I mean, France are probably favourites. They're the better team. Um, does this have the cue of destiny for Argentina? I'm not so sure. It'll be interesting to see how Argentina set up. I mean, they have changed their approach game to game. Lionel, Lionel Scaloni has generally got a spot on, went to a back three against the Dutch to match them up, went to a back four um, in the semi-final win over Croatia. He'll probably stick with a back four. How they deal with the threat of Mbappe is going to be interesting uh, and how um, how bold they are in, in response to it because we saw differing approaches so England took the cautious approach that Kyle Walker was picked at the right of a back four but he didn't go forward when England had the ball it was a back three Kyle Walker did not cross the halfway line to Mark Mbappe Morocco were actually the bolder of the two teams they pushed Hakimi on in the second half and because they knew Mbappe wasn't going to defend and just said okay look let's take the risk and you know it almost paid off you know Hakimi and Ziyech completely overwhelmed Theo Hernandez and, and Morocco created a couple of chances and France only really got got control back in the game when they put Mbappe up front and brought Marcus Churam on on the left to uh, provide a bit of defensive support so Molina is the right back for uh for Argentina it'll be interesting to see if maybe Di Maria is picked um and if Di Maria is, is indeed fully fit to see just to try and give France an issue uh, a problem going the other way because down there, down France's left, they're attacking wise, they're absolutely brilliant, but they're very de- defensively, they're very, very ropey. You know, Mbappe doesn't defend, and Theo Hernandez isn't very good at it. So it'll be interesting to see how bold Scaloni is there. Um, and Messi, look, I mean, Messi will drop into those pockets of space that behind Chaimani and behind Fofana, maybe Rabio will start again, where France have looked weak and he can cause damage there. But at, uh, as the Irish journalist Joe Callan was pointing out to me yesterday. Argentina have looked pretty, have looked better as they've gone on in this tournament, but they've never faced, they haven't yet faced a team with roll pace up front. You know, that, that is a big issue for them. And obviously France have that, um, obviously in, in Mbappe, but also in, in Dembele. Uh, Argentina play soccer like a great GA team with passion and skill, says Powell74, but are one bad challenge away from losing it and throwing it all away. You can see a bench emptying something happening if uh, if it's not going their way with five minutes left to go here and um, I for one am fully signed up to see how that uh, ends up uh, it's another one of the reasons why we, this Argentina journey is often so intoxicating like they're so brittle like they could snap at any moment they're you know I was, I was writing that they remind me of like a Jane Austen character who used to take to bed with an excess of feeling like I mean there's just so much going on with Argentina um, but they withstood the pressure of the semi-final quite admirably we'll see how things go uh, in the final and whether that pressure will be too much I mean I don't know. I, I did speculate whether it would be ahead of the semi-final, but maybe not. You know, maybe I, uh, maybe, maybe I was, maybe I was wrong on that front. I, I, um, it's not quite a fifty-fifty game with the bookies. France are slight favourites, but I think France should be much more favourites than they are for whatever reason. Like they're a significantly superior team, and uh, if Argentina pull it off, it, it's not that it's uh, preordained. It's that something magic has happened, or they've somehow dragged France down to a level where France forget that they are superior. Yeah, quite possibly, I think. But the, the other kind of magic is the magic man. You know, I think part of that is on, is kind of like almost like part of those rating Argentina are, kind of, are almost kind of willing it into existence because there's such a desire for this to happen for Leo Messi. But look, France are, yeah, I, I would agree with you. Like France are, are much the better team with, with the better players in most positions. But, uh, you know, Argentina do have the best player. I wonder what result, what we want from an Irish perspective. Like, do we want a World Cup winning France coming to Dublin in March, or do we want a. Like, hey, what's the best scenario here? Do we want, I mean, regrettably, Shane, I don't think it matters a whole yeah. lot. <laughs> Deschamps will be in charge. Like, I think we were wondering, like, was this Deschamps' last stand and that Zidane would take over and add further glamour to a game? In March in Dublin, which let's face it has way too much glamour as it is. <laughs> I would. Uh, I'm missing like our old pals at Denmark at this point. Um, don't know. Like I mean, the hope is you get France in, in some kind of World Cup hangover. Um, but I, uh, I don't. I, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to go to the World Cup final on Sunday worrying about <laughs> the uh, the impact on Ireland on March. I have to. I'm afraid I'm going to admit that. Uh, Deschamps is, is that like fully signed confirmed not like a ah we'll talk about that later or are we doing this just to 
I see. Now I heard. Uh, sorry, I only heard Philippe Auclair, uh reporting it and, and talking about it that the, uh, the the ambition for France was to get to the semi finals. At which point Deschamps could decide a future, and Deschamps evidently has now gone beyond the semi finals and, and clearly wants to stay. He's kind of a, he's a curious character, isn't he, Deschamps? Like he's got you know he's won the World Cup as a captain and as a coach, and now he could become the first coach to defend it. Um, well, actually, is he the first coach ever to defend it? Did Brazil have the same coach? Um, Back uh, sixty years ago, I genuinely don't know that, but he's he, he's slightly they did, yeah, Brazil. Colin, Colin, tell me they did, yeah, they did. Thanks very much, Colin. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but Deschamps is quite slightly unloved, but what he's done with the French team at this tournament has been fantastic. You know, he's taken, he's been faced with a major issue in that Kante and Pogba are injured, and he's addressed it by retooling his French uh, his forward line. Mbappe has gone from the right to the left. Uh, creation, as we've um, as we've talked about, has been created as a deep lying midfielder created with uh, starting French attacks and stopping opposition counter-attacks. And Giroud, Giroud was the ultimate facilitator up front four years ago. Didn't even have a shot on target for the full tournament. And now he's been tasked with scoring goals and he's uh, he's risen to the occasion uh, pretty much every night other than other than last night. So Deschamps des- deserves a lot of credit, I think, for the balance he's struck in that forward line. Uh, notably a balance, I would say, struck in the absence of Karim Benzema. Um, I saw a great stat on the Grinch, great of uh, the Get French Football News Twitter last night that uh, Deschamps has been in charge for five tournaments now. He's made the final of three of them and the two which he hasn't have been the two tournaments in which he's had Benzema on the team or at least available to him in the squad. And there's a curious little subplot uh, stirring ahead of the final is that Apparently, Benzema has been given dispensation by someone, I'm not quite sure whom, uh, to re- to link up with the squad and sit on the bench at the final on Sunday. And Deschamps was asked about this in the press conference and curiously just said, I would prefer not to answer that question. I'm sorry. And the matter was left at that, which would make me think that Deschamps isn't mad about this idea of Benzema coming back almost to just kind of earn a consolation World Cup medal. Um, so you'll have to see how that plays out. Yeah. What's going on? Is it Mbappe saying, here, listen, he's my mate? I have no idea. I have no idea. I don't know where these reports have come from, you know. Maybe they're coming from... Well, Marco reported think... Marco reported yesterday that he would have been fit for the round of last 16 or at least the quarterfinals if he'd stayed with the squad. The implication being that they, for whatever reason, decided they didn't need him around and they were going to go with what they had. As in, they could have kept him in the squad, but they didn't. And now all of yeah. a sudden it's like, oh, that story comes out... 24 hours later the bit he's rejoining the squad is he is he going to be eligible to play is there a possibility that he takes a penalty like uh, well he he would i mean he would be eligible to play because he's still named in the squad i mean the squad sheets that are sent don't change he's sent sent round uh, to us before the game he's listed on them but he's right. listed as absent or absent or injured so i would assume that there's no issue with him uh, coming back there it's not like you know he's been replaced by Colin Healy and all and all hope is lost um, but th- it's an interesting thing. Like, I mean, if it was initially reported, Merkel, I mean, that would be the Spanish press. So, I mean, they they do have a history of of, the, of these kinds of stories that may be sympathetic to the to the to the important players based in Madrid, um, playing and, international football elsewhere, and well connected. But yeah, yeah, exactly. So, it would be interesting. I mean, Benzema would clearly want to come back. I mean, I would take it from, by the tenor of Deschamps' qu- uh, answer last night that he is not too keen on it. And why would he? Like, I mean, he's got a he's got a great balance um, with that front with that forward line. I don't think you necessarily have to play Benzema if he comes back for the final. I really don't think you do. But maybe he feels like that that might upset some of the some of the happy balance that he's managed to yeah. strike in this World Cup and that's been crucial to uh, to their progress to the final. So very very interesting subplot to go into. Uh, to go into the final, I have to say. Um, you'd imagine that Deschamps has uh, the authority. Deschamps clearly doesn't want him there. I mean, if he did, he would be there. You'd imagine that Deschamps surely has the authority um, not to have Benzema on the bench, but it's just another it's another little thing for him to deal with. And in fairness, Argentina won't have any of these issues. Uh, Manuel Macron is, is urging the French Football Federation to give Didier Deschamps a new contract. This is a story from uh, yesterday. Um, this is this is this is the Emmanuel Macron who recently told us that there should be no mixing between football and politics, isn't it? Our compatriots need simple and pure joy. Sport provides it, <laughs> and football in particular. He told reporters after watching the game against Morocco last night. I am much better now than an hour and a half ago. We have sometimes suffered, but we have seen a very great team. I mean, uh, the France Morocco relationship and the subplot to that was very very interesting. Um, I'm talking to somebody 
about it. Uh, the French at least have um, an existential crisis about their responsibility for the atrocities that they committed around the world. This is not the same situation as other colonial powers, but still, it's uh, you know it was the colonial oppressor versus a former colony and like a very recent former colony. Like mm. uh, this isn't the ancient. This isn't eight hundred years of oppression. This is eighty years. It's like right, okay, people are still very much alive. Um, so unfortunately, Morocco didn't beat them because that would have been interesting. But at least we get the, the best football. Um, so a huge thank you to our coach Didier Deschamps and to his team, which is in fact a mixture of several generations, and that's what is great. Uh, and then he keeps going on. Deschamps three finals and he wins them. Never two without three. I mean, this guy doesn't watch a lot of sport. Obviously, that's not really how it works. But uh, there you go. Um, yeah, yeah. There was. Um, sorry, the last bit is a good bit. We bring back the cup, and obviously Deschamps must stay. This French team makes me very proud. So, you know, the emperor has decreed he gets a new deal. <laughs> well, there, that's the, uh, that, that's it, that's it, sort of. Deschamps will be coming with Fran- um, to Dublin with France in March. Uh, yeah, there were, just on your earlier point, there were a couple, there were a few boos of Lamar Saez in the, in the stadium last night, but nothing too intense from the, uh, from a stand that was, from a ground that was about 97% Moroccan fans, like the atmosphere that they generated throughout the tournament was outstanding. But I have to say that Fra- um, the Moroccan players and squad didn't, really stir that up at all throughout the tournament like the coach Regragui afterwards who was born in France said he will be he will be supporting France in the final that's fair enough Gav good stuff thanks a million lovely thanks a million guys great to chat to you enjoy the last week it's uh, Gavin Cooney there in Qatar this morning 